Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for, for having us. And Milda, thank you for joining. Thank you for coming. Um, very excited about this, this talk. Uh, when I was told that I got to interview uh, Milda, I, I started thinking about the questions right away. And I have them written down so I don't forget them. But real quick, my name is Paul Murphy. I am a partner at Lightspeed, uh, former founder. Um, went through some of the same things that Milda went through. So there's some relevance there, which we'll get to. Uh, for those that don't know Lightspeed, we're a global venture capital fund. Uh, we have offices in about uh, 11, 12 cities around the world. Um, I lead the team here in Europe, uh, which is one of our main kind of exciting focus areas for the firm. Uh, we've invested over a billion dollars into Europe, about 30 active portfolio companies, uh, groups like Vinted, which we'll talk about, but also Mistral and uh, Personio and a handful of other earlier stage companies. So enough about us. Um, I want to talk about Vinted, which we were fortunate enough to invest in, I think it was about five years ago, uh, give or take. And I thought, before we jump into the questions, just give us a little bit of context, if you don't mind, on the kind of relative scale of Vinted. For those, I mean, everyone knows Vinted, but just in case someone doesn't. Okay. So I guess that, uh, well, I realized that no one knows how old Vinted is. So we launched in 2008, so it's 16 years right now, this year. Uh, we operate in 22 countries at the moment, and we have millions of members all around the EU, mostly in Europe. So okay. that's the scale of, uh, of Vinted. That's a very modest introduction for those of you that know Vinted. Uh, the scale is, um, is, is pretty enormous. So anyway, let's, let's start from the beginning. Maybe you could take us back to 2008, you know, or, or whenever it was the, the idea kind of came to you, and, and what, what was the inspiration for that? How did it form? What did you start with? Okay, so. So actually, I started Vinted when I was 21. So I was uh, just finished my bachelor degree from, and I, I lived in my native town in Kaunas in Lithuania, and I was moving to Vilnius uh, for uh, studying master degree. And this is how I realized that I need to take all of my closet uh, to, from my mother's apartment to rent that one apartment, and which was like you know, then you pay for the rent yourself. You cannot afford to have a big apartment, and it's like you know. Oh my God, I need to take one third. I can't take only one third of my items. And then the idea was born like, you know, okay, what kind of items I can get rid of them? But some of them, well, most of them, they were worn once or twice just. So, you know, I, was, I felt smart enough that I need to find the new owners for, for those clothing. So that's the, how the idea was born. Okay. And before we talk about the kind of early days of Vinted, I'd just love to hear you had the idea, but then what did you do with that? What, did you, what was the first thing you built? Because I'm a product person, I obsess oh, over okay. this. Oh, so it was like, you know, it was, uh, uh, I don't know, is, is it nice to say, but it was such a crappy product at that <laughs> time. It was, if you would see our design, it was green from, taken from ice stock and from everything with some green grass and girl laying. We still have some with that design. But you know, we didn't have, so I had the idea. I went to the party and I met Justas, uh, the co-founder, and he was a developer. So he said, let's do it together. So in the party at 3 a.m., we agreed that let's do, the, let's do Vinted. And then, like in two weeks, we just uh, used us just uh, develop the website. And this is how we started. So we didn't have any design knowledge. We didn't have anything. And even then, we launched Vinted. It was like my friends are testing me, texting me. and like, no, so how to buy the item? And we, it seems we even forgot to develop the bottom, I want this item to buy. So it was like, you know, just a catalog for people to see. So, but it started as a website. Mm -hmm. uh, we did like, you know, that just for two years or two and a half years, it was just a website. And then the game changer was uh, introducing the app that changed everything for us. Okay. But you, so you had a sign of, you had signs of life from the website that told you this is worth pursuing. Yeah. Okay. And then the app is when you started seeing the, yeah. great. Um, I think it's an important lesson for that. I mean, for the founders in the group, I, you know, the people that I talk to that have had similar successes, it always starts with something very simple and not over-engineered. And actually, consumers or businesses will suffer through a pretty bad product if it actually provides value. So, yeah. But also, if I can add, yeah. so I think that for us, it was the key lesson, like number, lesson number one, 
that uh, later, at some later stages, we had like, you know, let's make the per perfect product, just make the perfect feature and only then uh, launch it. And it never worked because we tried to, be, to make it perfect, but you know, then we realized, okay, but done is better than perfect. Yeah. And then you get feedback, then you can improve, but don't try to be like, you know, the best of the best from the beginning. So. That's great. Well, so I want to talk a little bit about Lithuania and building a company in Lithuania. I'm a big believer that where a startup is born has kind of leaves a lasting impression on the business over time. I'm just curious what that, you know, do you agree with that? And if, if so, what was that in the case of Vinted? Oh, so it's, uh, it was wild, wild west, I would say. In 2008, it was like, you know, we were among, I guess, top five start startup companies in Lithuania in general. So I would say, I'm humble to say enough that it, we were like, you know, among top five at the beginning. And I remember that uh, in 2009, after one year, we won the award of the best startup of Lithuania. And like for me, it was like, what does it mean startup? So I went to Google and I Googled what does it mean startup? So that was the age. And if you would speak about VC, like venture capital or business angel, forget about that. It's like, like zero, like nothing. That's why we spent for the first two years, we spent our all our money. So it was about two or 3,000 euros in two years. So it was like, no, we didn't have any funding at that time. Oh. And how did you get introduced to funding then? Uh, they found us. They found you. Good <laughs> yeah. investor. Okay. Yeah, so the business, first business angel, they came to us and they said like, so Manta, so I think that you know him. Uh, he said like, guys, you are growing like insane, but it seems that you're still considering this as a hobby project because we considered like, we were like, you know, having normal jobs and we said it's like, we just want to have some, some hobby activity during the weekends and in the, in, in the evenings. And then Mantas joined us and said, hey guys, you don't know what you've created? I think so, uh, can, you do, can we do it together? So this is what then Mantas joined. And then Excel Partners also joined. So we weren't, we weren't that familiar about you know, stages, about seed, pre-seed. We didn't know anything about that. So Excel Partners, they came and they said, okay, maybe let's talk. And we said, okay, let's talk. This is how we started the journey. Great, uh, that's amazing. So I'm curious on the journey, um, and we'll talk a bit more later about where you are now, but on the journey, if you could sort of give us some of the highlights and challenges that you remember, most rewarding moments along the way. Oh, well, there was, you know, 17 years is a, lo is a long time. So I guess that the most rewarding part was that, um, you know, maybe it's, uh, it feels that you launched the product and it was growing from the first day. So it was growing like, you know, like, 120% each month. So it was, you know, like it seems that the market was so ready for that. And for me, it was, you know, it was a nice feeling that we kind of found, like, you know, had that sense that the product is needed. Though I was selfish, I created for myself, not for others, but uh, it turned around that it's, you know, it's suitable for others as well. Uh, so uh, regarding challenges, I think that was, um, you know, I was 21. So that says every, everything. <laughs> I didn't have any business experience. I almost never worked in a company, like big, no, like normal company. So for me, it was a challenge, you know, companies growing like insane. And it's, and you know, uh, the vintage needs me like this, but I feel I am still here, like, and I always need to catch up. So, you know, it was like a uh, kind of challenging uh, journey, I would say. Yeah. Just, you know, always, I felt like, okay, I need to catch up. I need to catch up. So it was always about that. So. Did you have any of these kind of, when I talk to founders that have built successful companies, they often refer to these kind of punched in the gut kind of moments when things on the outside look like they're going perfect, but then you have oh. one or two things that just really, as a founder, cause you to have sleepless nights or really set you back. Yeah, actually we had uh, lost, uh, one of the biggest issues that we had, so it's, I guess it's like for most of the startups, they all one day think about that, about business model. Because then uh, we got in the first investments, it was the ages where, uh, who cares about business model? Traction, growth is the key thing, and we're gonna think about money later. Which was very very good for us at the time, but at the same time, uh, after some time, after some years, you need to think about money, how you're gonna earn money. So so there were a time, like you know, seven years after Vinted was launched, that we, uh, we thought that we're gonna die, so we had about seven months left, uh, like money f in account for seven months, and that's it. And we made some drastic changes, and it succeeded. So because we are here now, but uh, we had some um, challenges, like yeah. almost that <laughs> company. 
That's great. I, I, I don't think people realize how many iconic companies that we know of today that almost died. Oh, yeah. Especially in Europe, there's quite a few. So that's great. So along the, along the way, um, it's, you know, it's been a long journey. And along the way, you decided that you know, maybe I should step back or change my role. Can you talk to us a little bit about your thinking there? Yeah, so I think it's a bit a female thing uh, because, we, well, what happened? So I started to, well, then I was 27, I said, I will never have kids because I want to, you know, because I'm enjoying what I'm doing and so on. There is no time for, you know, for kids. And then somehow my friends around and at Vinted, they started to have kids. I was like, no, oh, they're maybe they're cute and maybe I would like to have some kids. And, <laughs> and then we talked with uh, my husband. Okay, maybe let's um, cancel the plan not having kids. <laughs> maybe let's uh, now consider this plan. And we said, okay, so he's from business, from a startup uh, world. I am from startup and it's super intense. And we said, but no, maybe it's, uh, let's make it count. So if we leave our businesses, so let's leave for four or five kids. So, so now I have four boys, four in a row, like small boys and Family project also is finished. So I had Vinted project, I had family project. Now I guess it's the new stage for me, but that was yeah. the reason. Yeah. Uh, you know, well, one day you need to take a tough decision. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so it was a tough decision. I want to stick on this topic for a bit because I, um, I went through a similar journey when I was a, a founder of my company. Uh, I also decided not for, not because I was going to necessarily have kids, but um, that it was the right moment for me to find a new leader. And uh -huh. so I hired my successor and they did phenomenally well. They ultimately sold the business for more than I would have. Um, and I, a lot of the founders I talked to, I think carry some degree of shame around this idea that they can't see a company all the way to an IPO. And I'm just curious, obviously you had your family drivers, but when you step back, I think from a business perspective, yeah. did you ever but feel any of that pressure? That would be the case for, my as well, for me as well. Just like, you know, maybe there are, there are different reasons, but at some point there would be the same question. And I also, I'm also an investor at the moment, and I see lots of founders who, uh, who feel shame, as you said, but for me, like, you know, it's, for me it's so impossible. Like it's just rare cases where person can lead from founding the company to IPO or even more. Because I think that there are totally different skill set is needed for, for people. Because I see that you know, people who are doing the scale and they can do very good optimization, processing and everything, strategy. But in some cases, they are very bad at creativity, at uh, bootstrapping and everything. So it's, it's the, you know, the, you need to identify in which stage you are and just be there. So I, I think it's so normal, and for me it's so normal that I wouldn't even consider to, to feel shame for that. So it's like, I think, life. <laughs> I, th I agree, and I think it's great that more, more founders hear that message. So it's, it's powerful coming from you. One of the things we talk about is founders often have two roles. They have the founder role, which they never really, usually never kind of give up. Yeah. And then they have their operational role. Yeah. And I think you can leave your operational role, but keep your founder role, which yeah. I know that you're, you're doing. We'll yeah, talk about that um, as well in a second. So you've made this decision, this very difficult decision, um, but for, for phenomenal reasons, you decided to step back. Was, once you made that decision, did you find it difficult to relinquish control or hand things over to successors? Uh, you know, uh, I had the same interview in the morning and I had uh, the same question. And my answer was, you know, then you are pregnant, you have nine months to say goodbye to the company. So, so for me, it was very nice that I had, you know, slowly, like, you know, but, but before, for me, it was, you know, mind blowing. I couldn't, I couldn't even see myself, like, you no, know, I will not have vintage email. I will not be, like, in, in, like, strategy involvement and everything. And for me, it was kind of, maybe not a disaster, but it was, like, for me, it was emotional, um, really emotional, uh, hard. Uh, but nine months uh, passed, and it was like, no, with the time, you got used to that, and uh, it was much better. So, but, you know, it's, it's good that it wasn't a sudden shift. It was like, you no, know, yeah. I had some time, and also had time to delegate the team, to change myself or some other people. So, it's, you know, it wasn't that drastic change that I could, uh, you know, like, oh my God, it's drama, I'm dying, because I never expected that. So. Had you found your successor or someone that was going to assume so your roles? Or? Then I left the company, it was already big enough. And actually Thomas joined then, it was by accident, but he came as a consultant for a couple of months. And then after a couple of years uh, being a consultant, so he, now he's a CEO of, of the company. So 
he's super good. He's just uh, uh, he was just the person that we needed. So uh, what Vinted needed. So it's just like. It's really nice to hear these stories. And again, my own experience, uh, I, I remember when I told the company that I was going to resign, we did these uh, demo days on Thursdays and uh -huh. we'd have some drinks and I'm not a big drinker, but I, I, I downed a beer in like five seconds because I was, and I got up and I was like, okay, I'm leaving. And it was like, I was like shaking when I told the team. Oh. But when our successor came in, you know, he did things that I never would have done. And yeah, it was, I was exactly. in awe of his performance. Yeah. So. And especially the fresh view is so, um, we sometimes undervalue people who are coming from outside because they come with no some they don't take some deep knowledge that we used to have like you know some memories some like values and so it's, it's so good to have just fresh air and fresh thinking so yeah it's I would say in both of our cases we sort of got lucky though yeah. uh, getting a new executive into a company isn't always a slam dunk <laughs> often there's a lot of challenges yeah I'm just curious do you have any for people that may experience this at some point in the future, any tips or suggestions as to how to manage that transition? Transition, so, well, uh, I would be a fan of not doing fast uh, transitions because I think it's bad for a company, like for the team that's staying, because it's, uh, it might sound very uh, strange and you might look for secret agenda there. So I think that if you do it slowly, you stay, you um, delegate, you create teams instead of you. So I think that this is one of the key things. But also at the same time, well, you know, then you touch the shame uh, topic. Well, I, th I see that people feel that, that sometimes, you know, I feel like maybe I'm not enough because I wasn't able to lead till the end. But I think that maybe it's also just to recognize that it's so normal and it happens everywhere, every time, and it's like the like one on one of the of leading companies. So it's that would be my advice. And then what about onboarding new executives into the into the firm? Because I do think that that can if it goes wrong, even if the company's doing well, it can kill a company. It can. So that's why it's very important to have a very similar or well similar culture set that it wouldn't become like out of the blue, some, like someone that you don't, you know, lives a totally different life, the loves things that you like, no company doesn't, well, opposite. One thing, but the other thing, I think that um, I, as an investor, I see some bad cases where founders, which are replaced, or they, they step away, uh, step back, so they try to, any, like, a lead, uh, make the two different sides of founders and uh, a hired CEO. So I think that this is one of the biggest mistakes that you can ever do because if you do it like you come as a partner, you are all together, you do transition together, mm. like all hand in hand. So I think that this is, should, be, should be the successful uh, case. Okay, so it's, I guess it's, you know, don't, certainly don't resist it, yeah. but if you, if you are gonna make the change, treat them like a late co-founder or a close but partner. But also help, like, like uh, help new executive because I think that you know, then the new executive comes, okay, he is with a fresh uh, mind and everything, but at the same time, he's feel, he still or she feels alien here. So what you can do most, so you can help like, you know, feel the culture, feel like, you know, know the people, like, you know, that soft things that uh, new executives are hard to, you know, to, to get in like in one month or two months. So you just need some more more time. And then when you think about, you know, someone new comes in and potentially they might make some changes to your baby, the thing that you've been building. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How do you manage that? You tension? need to deal your ego here. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for me, it's, uh, it's a, you know, in our case, I, I would say our case is success case. So I'm very happy where Vinted goes. But as an investor, I still okay. see like, you know, lots of like, even not official fights. But some, you know, like you know, disappointments about, oh, I expected to be here, but the uh, new, new CEO is doing that. So, yes, that's true. But at the same time, I would say, like, you know, uh, okay, maybe you can be in a, on a board to do some impact, but at the same time, maybe like not to stuck in a, a founder's trap where, you know, you see your, your, like, you know, your baby, and sometimes, you know, your baby sometimes grow up, like, you know, and, you know, with your, like, you know, adult child, you, you, you should get some freedom to, to do, to follow his own way. So I think that for founders, it's very hard to do that, yeah. but it's an it's essential thing. So. I think it's such, a, such an important lesson. Um, again, we experienced this where we had, we had held back on these principles. In, yeah. in one case, it was a game studio. We didn't want certain things to happen. And then once I stepped away and we had a new leader and they let those things happen, 
the business exploded. And so it's, you know, I think these things can be very important in early days, but maybe you have to let go. But sometimes uh, I think that uh, it might get some feeling like, oh my God, why, why I wasn't there? Like, no, why I didn't do that? Yeah. So, so I imagine, so, as I said, you need to cope with your ego, ego. So because ego is something that you need to talk time to time and to say, relax, it's okay. So you're still, you still have your founder role at yeah. Yeah. Are you still involved in the company? Oh, I'm a shareholder, so uh, um, and yes, it's my baby. So you know, as you said, so it's like you cannot for you know. I I, I assume that you know, like Vintot now is like you no, know, how many? 16 years old person who says like, Mom, don't explain me anything. I know my way. That's okay. I'm okay with that. But I'm still involved. I'm, I always go there and I ask like, you no, know, how do you do? Uh, like, uh, can I help you? So so this is I'm still there. So but is uh, there a special founder room they put you in so you don't sort of disrupt the uh, <laughs> operations? Or? No, I, they, they don't <laughs> let me go there. No, so, but I, I don't ask actually. So yeah. for me, it's like, you know, I step away and for me, it's, I appreciate uh, to leave the company and it's still growing, like you know, to see yeah. that it's growing. So I guess that this is super nice occasion where I can create my own stuff, I can do my own stuff, but also not to be afraid of where Vinted is going, because I'm, to be honest, I'm super proud of Vinted, so. <laughs> Great, well let's, let's talk about the, you mentioned you've got Vinted, your family, and now you've got the sort of third phase of your, of your life, I guess. Yeah. Well, tell us about that, what are you up to now? Oh, so, so I am, I'm uh, launched a new startup. Now it's uh, in education because I have four kids, you know, so I am more interested where my kids gonna go. <laughs> so uh, I'm a selfish person again. So when that was born because I was selfish and I had a problem where to put my stuff. Now I'm selfish because I don't know where my kids gonna uh, learn. So this is uh, again, new startup about that. And also I'm a student. I fi By the way, while I was on uh, maternity leave for eight years, I finished three master degrees. <laughs> so, you know, I, I have some things to, you know, to do. Um, and also I'm, I'm a board member of several organizations, mostly education, uh, and I'm an investor. So, you know, I do now everything uh, piece by piece. And at yeah. the moment I'm enjoying that uh, period of, uh, you know, at the moment my biggest fear is go full time somewhere. So I said like, please don't let me, uh, don't force me to go anywhere full time because I have no, some one hour here, one hour here, one hour here. So I'm enjoying this, and I think that I give the most value like this. So. And when you think about, in the case of education now, what are the, I'm just curious, what are the one or two things that you took from your Vinted experience that you're trying to apply? So for me, team, like if you do it alone, it will, for me, it's, well, it's like, you know, the first time I just found about the idea, uh, I said, okay, I will not start without teams. That was my rule number one. So. Because if you're like, no, you, if you, uh, you know, have to challenging um, uh, challenges, big challenges, like uncertain challenges, it's, then you are alone to brainstorm with yourself. It's very boring and it's not very effective. So for me, it's like, no, if you want to make a big change, you need to have a big team. And the other thing, well, what we do actually, so the same as Vinted, like, no, we launched super crappy design right now. I wouldn't even, would, I don't want even to show you that design because it doesn't look nice, but it works. So what we did, like, we, we tested, we tried, and we said, we are not going to build cosmic ships, like, no, that it will be perfect. We just, like, agile principle, like, no, test, uh, create, test, create, test, and then you go up, 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 like, you know, and, and then it gives you a sense of achievement, you mm -hmm. get feedback, uh, you improve the product on the, on the way. So that would be like, for me, like, no, don't try to make it perfect. Just, just do it, that's it. <laughs> Great. Well, so I've kind of one last question, since you're now also playing the role of an investor in the companies that you participate in, do you have any advice for founders as it relates to getting the most out of your investors, whether they're angel investors or institutional mm -hmm. investors like Lightspeed? Mm -hmm. it's, a it's a difficult question. I'm going off script. Every time you would, every time you would ask me, like, I, would say, I would have different answers. So I, my answer today could be a tip for founders. Ah, okay. I don't know how it's in, uh, in other countries, but in Lithuania, we, I saw, in, uh, including us, we didn't have know-how about what investors expect. And sometimes they come with their contracts about liquidity preference, like you know, vesting, cliffing, uh, cliff and so on, and you don't understand. And it's, it's sometimes you kind of want to you know, get against uh, investors because you, you think that, oh, they are bad, they want to steal. And I think that this is very... Um, useful to have that you know, uh, uh, point of view from 
from uh, both sides and understand what investors expect, why they have those reasons, yeah. and uh, also, but it's, you know, it's the same for investors, they need to understand yeah. uh, founders' uh, perspective as well, so, you know, it's a win-win, they need to understand each other. So. Amazing, good advice to finish with. Thank you so much, Milda, appreciate it.